Hey guys, Montel here, and thanks so much for tuning in to this edition of Free Thinking with Montel. And today, I am so excited about having a guest on. I have a, I, I, you just don't know. Um, I've uh, wanted to have her on since the very beginning of Free Thinking, and now I've got her. So really, really happy. And uh, we're here to talk a little bit today about multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis can be a particularly debilitating disorder because your body is essentially attacking itself, but you can learn to cope during the attacks. So what causes multiple sclerosis? Well, multiple sclerosis, or MS, is a disease in which your body's own immune system eats away at the protective coating, that uh, sheath that covers your nerves. And the disorder disrupts the communication signals between your brain and the rest of your body, meaning that your nerve signals slow down or stop. And we don't know exactly why this happens. Uh, the most common thought is that it's a virus or a gene defect or both are to blame. Environmental factors may even play a role. And we do know that disorder affects more people, more women than it does men. And that you may get the disorder if you have a family history of MS or if you live in an area that is of higher risk in a particular area of the world where MS is more common. It's typically diagnosed between the ages of 20 and 40, but we've seen the disorder at any age. And now, you may ask yourself, well, how do you know if you have multiple sclerosis? Well, here to talk about it with me today is one of the most foremost experts in treating patients with MS and other neuroimmune disorders. She's an assistant professor of neurology and an attending physician at Corrine Goldsmith Dickinson Center for Multiple Sclerosis. And she's also received a bachelor's of science degree in chemistry from the University of Notre Dame and an MD degree from Case Western Reserve University. She's completed her neurology residency at Mount Sinai Hospital, where she served as chief resident. And in 2009, she was named the Mount Sinai Hospital Resident of the Year. She was also the recipient of the 2009 to 2011 Sylvia Laurie Found Fellowship from the National MS Society, which she joined the CGD faculty in 2011. She is one of my favorite MS doctors in the world, and she happens to be my own personal doctor as well. So, you know, please, please, Dr. Michelle Fabian, thank you so much for joining me today on Free Thinking with Montel. Oh, thank you for having me. Absolutely. And I really do mean that when I say, and I say it to the world, that you are my favorite doctor that I've ever had and dealt with when it comes to MS. So, doctor, you're an MS and, immune and neuroimmune specialist. Why did you pick this field to go into? So there are many choices in neurology uh, when you're a resident, what specialty um, to study. Uh, and really the reason I chose MS, I, I was fortunate enough to work with really one of the foremost MS experts in the world, Dr. Loveland, who's a director of our center here. And it, it really, of course, the research was so exciting, the breakthroughs were there, but really it was about that connection with patients that he uh, demonstrated with his own patients and um, really told me if I entered this field, this would be a chance for me to have uh, patient relationships that, that really span decades. Well, now, you know, MS is one of those diseases that I got to tell you, you know, though there may have been breakthroughs in the last few years, some slight breakthroughs, you know, diagnostics techniques for MS haven't really changed that much since uh, 21 years ago when I was diagnosed. So how do you diagnose a patient with MS? Well, the most important way to diagnose a patient, um, it doesn't require any fancy technology. It's listening to the patient. So uh, to have a diagnosis of MS, a patient must have clinical symptoms that correlate with MS lesions. Um, and so really it's about uh, when I first meet a patient, just sitting there listening to their story and hearing if they've had symptoms that are consistent with MS. Of course. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, of course, you know, there are symptoms that overlap with many other conditions. So once we, we verify that a patient has symptoms that, you know, sound like they could be MS, then we do move on to MRI, um, which is very sensitive in picking up MS lesions. And so that was the breakthrough, um, which started in the early 80s, realizing that a person with MS 
there is a character characteristic fingerprint in the brain and the spinal cord. Um, so we can see it, you know, on the MRI. And your uh, MS being when you have the lesions in the brain, uh, LS, lateral sclerosis, when you have lesions in the spine. But now let's talk a little bit about, and we, I know for a fact, and you know, and I want all of our viewers to make sure they understand that not any individual with MS seems to have the exact same symptoms. But there are some core symptoms that seem to be recognizable. I know uh, when my, my MS started in me, I uh, went through a whole series of just extreme eye issues, you know, from optic neuritis, optic neuropathy, I had an afferent pupillary defect, I had a uh, it just came out of nowhere. No one could explain it. I was in the military at the time and literally went 20 years being misdiagnosed, mm-hmm. which I find crazy. But maybe if you could give out just a couple of core symptoms that people could think about, you know, going to talk to the doctor about and make sure they explain it to them. Sure. So one thing that's really important before we talk about the symptoms with MS is that they do have to last longer than 24 hours because all of us have neurological symptoms from time to time sit a certain way, your leg goes a little numb, you know, things can happen like that. But if they don't last 24 hours, then it's very unlikely that it's from MS. So I always tell my patients to really, um, when they're monitoring their symptoms, to remember that too. Um, And as you talked about with the optic neuropathy, where the lesion is does make a difference. And so uh, the classic symptoms of MS would be um, a decrease in vision. So that would be uh, optic neuritis, um, double vision um, is another one, numbness, and the numbness could be on the face or it could be, you know, on half of the body or in the legs, weakness, and again, like on half of the body or in the legs, and um, people can also have bowel and bladder issues. And let me ask you a question now. I mean, in some of these cases, like you, you said, some of these symptoms also uh, are associated with other illnesses. Yeah. But there seems to be, even within the MS diagnosis, there seems to be like two separate types of disease. I, I, I've often wondered, are, you know, are we diagnosing multiple diseases and putting them under the same moniker, or are they really the single disease but just having different exacerbating symptoms? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a question that every doctor, as they go through their training, asks ourselves as well? Are, are we seeing many different di- diseases, you know, in, in this clinic and calling, it, calling them all MS? And that's where the MRI does help us because people do have different symptoms, you know, and it's, it's based on probably where the lesion is, how many lesions they have. But at the same time, you know, their MRIs have that characteristic finding. And really, I have to tell you, after you see more and more patients, you realize that um, people are more similar than different but everybody, you know, may have their individual symptom profile. And then what, what is the factor that determines, you know, the severity of the illness? I mean, I know people who, you know, are diagnosed and then a month later they're in a wheelchair and uh, maybe two months later they're incapacitated to the point that they literally can't leave their home. And other people like myself, you know, and, and, and others, uh, it seems I hope I'm keep knocking on wood that it stays this way, but You know, um, it seems like it's a very, very slow, long duration of degradation. Yeah, and it's a a really good question. Um, And it's very frustrating for me to tell you we don't know for sure why people may have different um, onset to their condition like that. Um, it, It does matter where the lesions are. Um, and so a person, thankfully, is a very rare um, situation when a person's in a wheelchair that quickly. Um, but, it, you know, it, it may be one lesion in a certain location that can cause something like that to happen. Um, and again, it's that's very rare. Um, but we do know that other people have many, many lesions throughout their brain and spinal cord and they're basically normal. Um, and so th- there are a lot of different factors that probably play into how one person manifests compared to another. And there are a lot of different factors that play into how each individual patient should manage their illness, i.e., you know, managing it with medicine, managing it with lifestyle changes, exercise, uh, managing the stress, right? Yes. Well, I would say that a patient typically should should do all of those things. Um, Patients come to me often and they ask me about the holistic approach. 
And I'm all about the holistic approach and I use it in a slightly different way, but holistic with the W, the whole approach. Um, So for most people with MS that would include a medication, not for everybody, but for most people. Um, But you and I both know that the medication by itself is not really going to help a person live the best life they can live. And so really you have to combine that approach with, uh, you know, the wellness, um, um, the wellness, I I call them like foundations of wellness, you know, the building blocks. Um, So like you said, you know, nutrition is key. Um, to being healthy, to feeling healthy, exercise, um, you know, emotional um, wellness, maybe seeing a therapist, being in a support group. All of these things are important in order to feel as good as you can feel. Well, now, especially right now during this last full crazy year of COVID, I mean, I think, you know, it's it's put stress on everyone, no matter, you know, what your plight in life is. Yeah. But I would think that for people with MS, and especially I, I heard recently that, you know, uh, you know, COVID affects people with MS differently than the regular population. Is that true or is that false? So um, thankfully, from what we could see, um, most people actually with MS, their risk is not higher than people without MS in terms of getting COVID or severe COVID. That being said, people that are older and use a wheelchair to get around, they may be at higher risk. Yes. Gotcha. And stress being one of the biggest factors, is it not, when it comes to MS attacks? Well, stress is a really complicated topic. And the reason why is because when people have an MS relapse, the first thing they do, and it's just human nature, is you look around and you say, what caused it? And the truth of life is that there is always stress around us. So then people look and they say, oh, that was the stress. And true, true and unrelated, we don't know. There, there are some studies out there that really have not been able to link high uh, stress with uh, MS onset. But, you know, my patients certainly tell me at times, like, I know why that happened. It was really stressful at that point in time. So it's, it's hard to know for sure. It's very interesting when it comes to whether or not it's genetically predisposed. I mean, like I'm a person who's uh, in, the, in my family, we have no one that I know of with a family history of any neurological disorder. And then bingo, bango, here I come. Uh, but I also know I look back in my past, you know, I uh, literally was born, you know, and, and raised for the first five years of my life about you know, less than a block and a half away from the Baltimore City dump, which was one of the first hazardous waste cleanup sites uh, that was a super fun cleanup site because of, you know, uh, Bethlehem Steel and all that that he did. So there was all kinds of ridiculous chemicals in that that dump. And I used to, as a child, and so did all the child children who lived in that ghetto, we used to play in that dump. We used to play in the trash and run around that dump. So I look back at my life and I think to myself, well, if there was environmental reasons, that would be one of those that probably was what triggered it in me. Mm-hmm. But we still don't know exactly what triggers it in individuals, do we? Yeah, I mean, when I was training, uh, one time one of my teachers said, if a person, you know, if you're looking at a patient thinking if they have MS and somebody in their family has MS, then you have the wrong diagnosis for the patient you're treating because they, you know, it, the old thinking was that it was so unrelated. Um, genetically, but we are finding more and more that there is a genetic predisposition. It's, it's not a hundred percent, you know, it's not one of these, um, things like these diseases that are passed down generation to generation. Um, but there, there are some, um, some factors, but you're right, you know, people's diet, toxins, they may be exposed to smoking, all of these things probably also play a role. Wow. Well, you know, now I, 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 I know there are some, have been in the last couple of years, some pretty tremendous breakthroughs. I mean, I, when I was diagnosed, heck, there were only three drugs. They called the ABC drugs. Yes. That were around back then. And, and you know, I've uh, had success with one of those uh, for now 20 years. But um, there now must be at least 14 or 15 different in, uh, drugs out there, right? There are. And I have to tell you, I should have counted um, before I came on here. Um, but there's that many that actually you have to count now. Um, and uh, really, it's a, it's a different world. And that's one thing I, I want to say today. It is it is a different world even than 10 years ago when I started as an MS doctor. 
And, and, and people need to understand that though they may talk to one person and they say, well, I happen to be on XYZ regimen, that doesn't necessarily mean could be the regimen that would work for them. That's exactly right. Yeah, it's really, it's a patient specific um, experience. And one of the frustrations, right, because you can't just take the same treatment plan from patient to patient to patient, um, because people have different um, side effects and, you know, um, and different preferences. So it's really, it's individual. Well, can you talk a little bit about the differences in some of those therapies? I mean, all of them are, in a sense, autoimmune modifiers, right? Yes. Yes. So our oldest drugs are, um, we used to call them and still do the ABC drugs. They are injections that a patient gives to themselves. And um, one class of drugs is called uh, interferon. So interferon is actually a chemical that your body makes itself uh, during something like the flu. And so people on those drugs um, would often get flu side effects from them. Um, But they were our first drug that we had for MS. So that was uh, the first sign of hope in really controlling the condition for people. And we should say that those interferons weren't necessarily developed for MS. They were developed before MS, well, before they started, uh, they developed it for a different illness and then figured out that it had some impact on MS, right? Yes, they've been studied in multiple illnesses, yes, and are still used in, in other illnesses as well. There's other types of interferons too, um, like for hepatitis uh, C, there's interferon. So, um, and it's a broad mechanism of action, like you're saying. So it wasn't that people were looking specifically to MS and, and designing a drug for it. It was just something that thankfully did work um, to some degree for MS patients. Um, interestingly, they're actually uh, have been possibly shown to be a benefit in COVID. So, um, you know, most people aren't on interferons anymore, but um, yeah, they were, they were brought back in COVID research. And then I understand of a couple of, one of the other drugs was literally a drug that was developed to help um, spark MS symptoms in primates. And that drug then was refined and tuned. And we realized that it did, I guess, modify the immune system enough to help the immune system attack, right? That's right. That That is glutyrimer acetate. And that it was a very interesting story, as you said, um, really trying to promote uh, the condition in animals for research. and But the animals did not get the MS. And the researchers were frustrated by that. And finally, they realized it was because that um, that uh, medication was actually helping prevent it from from starting. So, um, and it's a very old medication. I call it tried and true. It's very safe, uh, which is great. But again, it's that broad mechanism of action. So it works amazingly well for some people, but it's not the most powerful uh, medicine out there these days for for others. And now there are now after the first the ABC drugs. Now we've created a whole family of drugs that were developed specifically for MS, correct? That's right. That's right. Um, so there are um, pills. There's a, there's a whole uh, bunch of pills now. And those pills, interestingly, they have been used in other conditions as well. Um, so, you know, one of our pills was first used in psoriasis. Uh, one of our pills has been studied for organ transplant and for uh, Crohn's disease. And then another one actually is a twin of a drug used in rheumatoid arthritis. So I think that's really smart. You know, if you can look to the specialties around you and if things are working uh, for other autoimmune conditions to, to bring it into your own condition, um, that's, that's really smart uh, science. So, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I, I, I know I was uh, very instrumental in helping to fund a study at the, the Karolinska Institute that, you know, if you talk to uh, Swedes, they like to claim that MS is a Viking disease. Um, and uh, they found uh, some uh, thin line association between MS and rheumatoid arthritis. Is that true? There is a shared characteristic there. You know, the, the genetics, instead of really people having a predisposition to other neurological disease in their family, you will see actually people have other autoimmune diseases in their family. So rheumatoid arthritis would be one of them that, you know, patients, relatives may have. Wow. And I mean, this is really truly all about trying to help, you know, a person's quality of life. Now, these, these drugs 
seem to lengthen the time between exacerbations or does it seem to help put the, the disease in check? What does it do? So our goal um, 2021 is very clear and it's really to just stop anything new from happening with a patient. So that means no new lesions from developing when we check an MRI, which is usually once a year. It's uh, no new relapses for sure. You know, um, remember that there's nine times as many silent lesions usually in MS than, you know, compared to lesions that cause a relapse. So we want to stop all the lesions. We want to stop the relapse. And then we want a patient to look the same from time to time on their exam that their walking speed's the same, that everything is just as healthy as the last time. So um, thankfully, because we have so many treatments, uh, we achieve that goal with many, many of our patients now where we really control the MS um, in any way that we can measure. And, and what's what's new? What's coming down the pike? I, I had a long conversation with Dr. Weiner. I don't know if you know who he is, Dr. Weiner at Harvard. Yes. And you know, I'm involved with the uh, you know, the Brigham and Women's uh, MS Foundation uh, that Ann Romney started, Neurological Foundation they started. Um, but what's new coming down the pike that, that you know of? Well, before we talk about what's new, um, the new S medications that are FDA approved are our medications that are infusion medications. You were asking me about medications that are very specific for MS. So I just wanted to point out that we do have now multiple of those as well. Patient usually goes to the infusion center and gets an IV treatment. And um, those treatments are really the, the most effective and they really, for most people, stop any new MS activity at all. So that's been, I think those infusion medications, it really has been the revolution in, uh, in treatment for a lot of our patients. And is that once a year uh, infusion, once a month? What is that? It depends on the treatments. Um, we have uh, ones that are monthly, uh, one that's every uh, six months, and then one that's once a year for two years. Wow. Yeah. I, I I had not heard of that. That's really that's incredible. Yeah. And and uh, does it depend on the the type of and have we have we now? I mean, there was a while where there were categories of MS. Have we changed that and just now just call it MS, or are there still categories? There's remitting or lapsing. There's you know uh, uh, primary progressive. There's you know progressive. Uh, 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 have we changed all that? Yeah, no, we still have those categories. And really what those categories are, taking us back to me telling you that uh, really it's about listening to the patient and how their MS has uh, presented. So patients that have relapses, those are symptoms that come on over days and weeks. Um, those are people that have relapsing uh, remitting MS. Progressive MS is really completely different. And those are people that just have a worsening of their symptoms Usually it's like a motor weakness for months and years. And they just like, when you listen to a story of a patient, you can see right away if a person's having more of a relapsing type of disease, that's where our treatments work the best is for relapsing disease. We really can just stop that in most people. Progressive MS is more difficult to treat. Wow. Now, do you think that uh, possibly there could be a cure coming down the pipe in the next five to 10 years? I hope that there will be a cure. I think that five to 10 years, um, and of course my patients ask me and they say, I'm not getting any younger doc, I need the cure. And um, I think one thing to you know, really consider is the difference between complete control over the disease and cure, right? So cure means I can give a patient a treatment and then the MS is gone. And I hope for that, you know, and people have looked at different strategies uh, for that and still are studying different strategies. Um, but we're not quite there yet. Um, and so really, it's more about complete control at this point. Control and controlling it, stopping the exacerbation, stopping the re the remitting. OK, got yes. it. Yeah. And, and, you know, I know that, you know, for most people who have this illness, it's really more about you know, if you can, dealing with what you have. And so what, what would be some advice that you give to people uh, in that regard to, you know, again, we've already talked about exercise, diet, making sure that you, I guess, starting a medication as soon as possible would be part of that. But then, you know, um, the day-to-day, -day, what do you suggest for people? Well, of course, it is different for every person. So one thing I've learned is I can't really just... 
uh, foist upon somebody else my ideas of what they should do for their own wellness, right? So it works best when people really do feel it in their heart and they say, this is going to be good for me and they feel motivated and they stick with it. And it's hard sometimes to get to the place where people know what's going to help them the most. Um, but I love those visits because when they do, they come back um, and they say, you know, I feel so much better. And you could just tell it's a real change. Um, yeah. So one thing that might help is talking to other people with MS. And I, I just had a new patient diagnosed last week and she didn't know, but one of her high school friends also has MS for like 10 years. And her friend called her and said, you know, I have this and look at me, I've lived my life for the last 10 years. And you could tell that that patient was ready to really face the challenge after hearing that from somebody else. Right. And, and maybe also, could you speak a little bit about how important family is to, you know, the person who has the illness? I mean, you know, a lot of times, you know, people, who, you know, I was speaking to someone yesterday who was dealing with, you know, uh, uh, very early onset um, uh, diagnosis of Parkinson's. And, you know, he hid the disease from his own family for seven years. And where, because he didn't recognize that they would be as supportive as they had been. And it's a family, his family has literally helped to help him get his disease not in check, but at least be able to cope with and deal with and, and work with. You know, a lot of people with MS also, you know, I suffered in silence for about seven months. I didn't tell anybody. Um, how important is it for people to recognize that they should reach out and get the help from their family if they need it? That's a really good and important question, I have to say. Um, so all of us have a condition at some point in our lives, you know, and neurology, for some reason, when people have neurological conditions, of course, it is such a it's such a personal, um, you know, uh, experience because it, people worry that it's going to change the way that other people, I think, view them. And um, I've had many patients over the years that uh, do hide the condition, like you say. And I think that it does, um, it impacts them negatively as time goes on. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one thing I think that's really important is to tell your children, you know, if people have children, I've had some patients who uh, they don't want their children to worry about them, you know, is really the reason they'll tell me that they don't tell their children. But I have a different view on it. And it's that the child will see that they're living with MS and they still are continuing in the world. And um, then they don't feel like they're obviously keeping something from them as well. And really every time that a patient goes to their family and reveals the, the diagnosis, they come back to me feeling relieved that they did. That's excellent. Well, I know, you know you're very busy and I can't thank you enough for being a part of this, uh, you know, our free thinking show today. And I think people who are tuning in understand why I say I, you're my favorite doctor, because it's just from a personality standpoint, I wish there were so many more MS doctors like you. Wow. It's my privilege. Yeah, it's a, you're amazing. Very, very calming. And, and you know, um, anything new, new coming down the pike? And I ask that question in a sense of not just from a standpoint of, you know, medications, but, you know, any new uh, insights that you may think of or that people should just stop and think about? Well, I mean, I do think that... We have so many medications that can stop relapses now, um, but it's working on the repair of the uh, myelin and actually the, the nerve itself. Um, so that is happening. Um, and thankfully during COVID, the research continued, you know, um, so repair and then of course, um, uh, protection of the nervous system. Uh, so hopefully in the near future, we are gonna see that. We have stem cell trials going now. Um, and there's two types of stem cells, and I know that's a whole different topic, but um, there are stem cell uh, studies going about repair and protection. That's very exciting to me, and I'm really hopeful for those. Now, that's really exciting to me, too. I, I, I you know, I think, um, you know, a lot of us who have MS have symptoms that, you know, are just continuous, that you know, they've never gone away, and I would love to figure out a way to, to get involved. And are there studies out there that people should know about? They are small studies right now, um, but they 
are um, enrolled and uh, going. You know, these studies are usually about 50 to 100 people at a time, but all we need is one positive result, I think, for that study to become a, a really big study. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm tired. And that's really exciting. That gives hope. And I think that's what the one thing that people need to have is hope. So I can't thank you enough for being here and sharing that hope, Dr. Fabian. And good luck to you. And, and please, I hope you stay well. Uh, you know, I, you got your vaccine, didn't you? I did. Glad. Yeah. There you go. I'm so glad you yes. did. And, yeah. I'm happy you. and um, you know, as soon as I can get a chance to fly a little bit, I think I'm gonna come up there and see it. That sounds perfect. Okay, for sure. Will you be well? You stay well and make sure you all tune in to our next Free Thinking with Montel. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Fabian. Thanks for joining me on Free Thinking with Montel. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear feedback, so please send us your comments.